All right, so welcome everybody to uh, this GEMA panel, Monetizing in the New Digital Economy. Uh, very interested to dig into, this, uh, dig into the discussion tonight. Uh, we've got three panelists from across the media, technology, entertainment spectrum, uh, all three Hoyas. Uh, we'll do some introductions in just a moment and then dive into it. Uh, quickly just introduce myself. Uh, I'm Matt McMahon. I may know some of you on, on the other side of the camera. Uh, a two-time Hoya, School of Foreign Service way back when. And then went and got my MBA as well too. I've been working with GEMA really since the inception of it. And I'm currently the co-chair uh, here in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, media entertainment background, uh, over a decade at 20th Century Fox Film and TV doing digital distribution and the mobile content uh, initiatives. And then spent the last seven and a half years at a mobile content startup, uh, which was really fun and interesting. So I've nibbled around some of these, these issues, but the folks on the panel are much more directly involved in the uh, the day to day of what's going on currently, from NFTs to Paramount Plus to the creator economy. So, uh, without further ado, I will ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves, uh, maybe give a little bit of their background, uh, you know, where they are now, how they got there, uh, just to spend a couple minutes so folks have the context as to who's who and what's what. And maybe we could start with Tiffany, go to Stephen, and then wind up with Jeff if that's all right. So, Tiffany, take it away, please. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm super excited to be a part of this discussion. Um, so my name is Tiffany Stevenson. I'm the Chief People Officer at Patreon, um, and it's a membership platform, and we'll dive into that a little bit later, where I've been for the past um, year and a half looking after um, our global uh, people community and making sure we're taking care of all of our uh, teammates around the world. Um, prior to that, um, I spent a few years at Box, which is an enterprise content management platform. Um, um, so this has been my last two tours have been more tech forward. Um, prior to that, I spent about 12 years at Sephora, um, where I served as the head of talent for Sephora Americas and uh, did a stint at Schwab. So um, yeah, I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, there's no, no common thread you can find with any of those uh, roles or industries, but um, a lot of fun. And I think that variety is the spice of life. So maybe I'll leave it there. Good deal. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Steven DiPianco, um, CEO of a consulting company called Metaverse Marcom, which we'll get into later. My background um, started off primarily as a creator, as a filmmaker. So after Georgetown, went to NYU, got a master's in fine arts and filmmaking, um, produced a Academy Award winning short film called God of Love, uh, and then switched over to the digital side, digital video, was a YouTuber, uh, a partner of PBS Digital Studios. I got to make a video with Cookie Monster, which you can find on YouTube. Uh, that was pretty cool. Um, and Very then cool. Um, switched to the business side and worked with companies like YouTube, um, led a digital team at Ovation Television, working with creators, uh, went over to Verizon, um, managed um, sports programming for their uh, Go90 app, and then ran a startup called Dad Ventures for a number of years. Um, and then now I'm focused on the metaverse. Very cool. Uh, hi, everybody. It's Jeff Schultz. Um, I work for Paramount right now. Paramount is a global media company with uh, a pretty vast set of media assets in the US. That's the CBS broadcast network, Viacom cable networks. MTV, Comedy Central, as well as what is my focus, our streaming properties, uh, Paramount Plus and Pluto. At Paramount, I have two roles. One is the Chief Strategy Officer for streaming, so I'm responsible for our overall streaming strategy, and then Chief Business Development Officer, where I'm responsible for finding ways for us to grow through partnerships in streaming. Um, I've been doing this in one form or another for over 20 years. Um, I, I've worked for major media companies, NBC, CBS, Viacom, and now Paramount. And then along the way, I did three startups, all media related. But I did start my career as a, as a lawyer. Uh, I graduated from Georgetown in 1997 from the law school and spent, uh, and spent two years in, in London practicing, uh, practicing law before I transitioned out of law to the business side and then from financial market stuff to media and entertainment. Very good. Thank you all three. So as I mentioned, it's a, it's a very diverse set of backgrounds and interests. And as we get into now the, the companies and the roles of the companies, that's also very uh, different, uh, which I think is awesome because it gives us a different perspective on multiple topics in the space. Uh, but to take a, just a step up 
with the title of the panel, right? Monetizing the new digital media economy. Uh, that's a pretty, that's a, that's a mouthful, right? Uh, but before you can look to monetize the new digital economy, we want to kind of understand what, what we mean by that, right? And I think at least for this panel and for this discussion, we want to focus on probably the biggest part of that, whether it's an evolution or a revolution, certainly can be open for debate and discussion here tonight, but it's direct to consumer, right? Direct to consumer is now remade the digital content and media ecosystem. Uh, companies have scrambled, companies have, have uh, evolved, companies have, have really innovated in a big way. And each of, the, each of the panelists in each of their respective current companies really plays a part in that in a different sort of fashion. And so uh, with that as kind of an umbrella context uh, for the topics of the panel, maybe we'll run it back in reverse order. Jeff to Stephen to Tiffany. Uh, could you explain, you know, again, with a little more detail, who your current company is, uh, how, what space are they playing in? Uh, it could, you could certainly say, Matt, it's not even D2C, right? But uh, within the, the D2C direct to consumer world, what might it be? Uh, and just sort of start to dive into that and in the role that they're playing in this new digital economy with that, with that D2C umbrella as a bit of the context. Uh, and Jeff, certainly sure. for maybe if I could kick it off with, with Paramount and Pluto, those are two very different things, at least to my understanding, right? One is, uh, SVOD and one is FAST. And if you don't mind even, I mean, I can hand you those two acronyms. And if you don't mind sort of explain the companies and how those go and even those two acronyms, maybe we'll start there. And like I said, go to Stephen and then go to Tiffany as it comes. For sure. Happy to. Well, um, so at a, at a high level, as I mentioned, Paramount is a, is a massive global media company, has been around for a long time and owns really important, really significant traditional media assets like the Paramount studio or i mentioned the cbs broadcast network cbs sports and that is a, a massive advantage in building direct-to-consumer businesses but it it comes at a trade-off which is those legacy businesses are challenged um you know we need to acknowledge as a company that 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 a transition is necessary from traditional business models into direct to consumer business models. And, um, you know, that's the easy part is acknowledging that it must happen. Making it happen is, is difficult. It's challenging. And, and for some, you know, for some companies, it winds up to being impossible. And so on the strategy side, a huge portion of what, what I do is, is drive what I call internally alignment. Um, but it's, you know, it's it's ensuring that everybody in the company, even when they're not directly vested in the success of our growth in streaming, at least understands why it's the future for the company. Um, I'll illustrate when I, I came to Viacom by way of the acquisition of Pluto. I was the chief business officer at Pluto at that at, at that startup, which was acquired several years ago, and. It turned out while, you know, I probably spent 80% of my time focused outside the company at Pluto, driving the growth of Pluto through partnerships. I quickly wound up spending about 80% of my time inside the company at, at what became Paramount, ensuring that everybody understood what Pluto was, why it was a very, very promising business. And by the way, it wasn't a huge business when Viacom bought the business, um, $70 million-ish in annual revenue. And last year, that company generated Pluto TV over a billion dollars. It's one of the fastest growing media companies in history, but that wasn't obvious three or four years ago. And so ensuring that people understood not only that they had an extraordinary opportunity now at, at hand, how their businesses um, and the existing organizations supported it and how we could sort of grow together. And so I wound up spending so much of my time evangelizing and aligning and and it wind, and when you successfully do that, this traditional business, which for some can feel like a dead weight, winds up being this huge competitive advantage where, where the brands and those audiences, the content, the characters, the franchises all start to align to support the growth of streaming. And then that opportunity evolved um, about um, two years ago. Uh, the decision was made, a, a, a legacy product called CBS All Access, which was one of the first standalone subscription video on demand services, um, was uh, it was run independent of Pluto TV. So we had a free strategy product and org and a paid strategy product and org within streaming. The decision was made to merge those, not the products, but the organizations, and thus create the opportunity to, 
to coordinate and align the two strategies. And so Tom Ryan, the, the founding CEO of Pluto TV, became the CEO of that division. And that gave me the opportunity to have a strategy and business development role that, that oversees both. And it's just fascinating where, where you know, the, the businesses are so different, but they're leveraging so many of the same trends, trends like uh, not just you know digital and over the top consumption of content, but but connected te television in particular, right? Even if you have cable, you probably have your television connected to the internet, and these are huge growth catalysts for both of those business businesses. But then when you dive in deeper, Paramount Plus that's a first party service. This is fueled by content that we own and control and continue to create. It it also has a different business model for for consumers. It's 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 a paid product with a five dollar ad supported tier and a ten dollar paid tier. The the Pluto TV business model, not only is it free, it also looked, I hope everyone tries it out if you haven't tried it out. It's just television. You just turn it on. You, you don't have to pay. You don't have to give, it, uh, give us any information. And it's a linear grid. It's got a guide. And, and so you don't even have to decide what to watch. You just look through the channels. But, but un, also unlike Paramount Plus, there are a couple hundred content partners, third party content partners fueling Pluto TV. So that puts us in a position where we're building our streaming business in a way that a company like Paramount never had in, in the past, where, where Paramount and a company like Disney, like think all of, all of the major media companies leveraging their own content and brands and franchises. And now we have this opportunity to create this exposure and create a, a flywheel with a couple of hundred partners to grow a, a third party content business. We'll dig into more of this, Jeff. I find this fascinating, having touched a little bit of this at Fox, but you're, when you speak to the internal alignment that at Pluto, you spent 80% of your time on external sort of partnership development and evangelization, but now at a big media company, you have to spend 80% of your time on internal alignment and evangelization. I, I hear you on that entirely. And that's, it's a very interesting shift from kind of an external startup business to an internal Right. Or if you will, it's it's and that, uh, it depends on the day whether I have to do it or I get to do it. Right. It really does feel it really does feel like a privilege. And I will say one of our one of our stated values in the streaming group is collaboration is a superpower. And my point my point there is that everybody's fighting internally about who gets credit, about how quickly you innovate, whatever else. And a company the size of Paramount or Disney or whatever else that's doing it right, that's able to align behind growth, will create a competitive advantage. Yeah, I think well put. Uh, I'll hand to Stephen now too as well to kind of be again, uh, uh, what you're doing right now and kind of the, 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 the world that you're playing in the slice of the big direct to consumer economy. I will just very quickly encourage the folks uh, in the audience. We are going to uh, speak for you know, maybe the first half hour to 40 minutes of the panel. Uh, and then I would love to take some audience Q&A. We will sort of filter the Q&A, but please start to put them into, uh, into not the chat button, but the Q&A button, I believe. And we'll start to go through those and, uh, and, and moderate them a little bit. But we'd love to have some interactive as best we can uh, with, uh, with the bit. So uh, Stephen, to you, please. Yeah, so, so my focus, as I mentioned, is, is on the metaverse. I've started a metaverse consulting business called Metaverse Marcom. And at Metaverse Marcom, we're focused on helping entertainment and sports brands with innovation, strategy, and marketing in the metaverse. And primarily um, focused on helping brands get started in the metaverse on platforms like Roblox. So I'm not sure how many people are familiar with Roblox. I have three kids who uh, are six, 10 and 11 years old and, and play Roblox all the time. And Roblox as a platform uh, has, you know, players play as 3D avatars uh, in these 3D virtual worlds. The platform has its own currency, which is called Robux. Uh, there's 58 million people who play this game every single day. And so um, what's been interesting is that there's more and more brands that are saying, hey, we want to understand the metaverse. We see that there is something going on here, uh, not only in terms of sort of future potential, but just currently in terms of user behavior, especially with Gen Z and Gen Alpha spending time on platforms like this. And we want to connect with uh, customers in this way and build experiences. And a little sort of spin on direct to consumer is this idea of direct to avatar. So selling virtual items, whether virtual clothing, hats, et cetera, to, 
to users on these platforms and, and you know, processing microtransactions and, and generating revenue and, and marketing impressions. Um, and so for me, uh, it's a very, you know, brand new space. This is very much uh, very new. And so there's a lot of brands that are interested in getting involved. Nike, Gucci, um, Tommy Hilfiger, Spotify, all of these brands have created experiences um, on Roblox. And, and so for me, um, I've been building relationships within Roblox, really understanding how these platforms work. And this just is very much similar to what I was doing 10 years ago when I started my YouTube channel. It was like really kind of get to a platform early, understand what the playbook is. How do you build audience? How do you show up in a way that the community uh, finds authentic? And how do you take your sort of brand voice and express it in this new medium, which is very different than um, than just like creating videos or or creating shows. It's like creating experiences and games, and so uh, that to me is uh, is really exciting. And um, yeah, it's just um, you know I'm not sure exactly how like direct to consumer. You're still going through an intermediary, whether it's a whether it's a Roblox, whether it's a Fortnite or NFT blockchain uh, platforms like. Uh, sandbox decentraland so there's all these platforms out there with different audience demographics with different scale um but but you know for for me it's just like it's just brands following audience it's like hey where's the audience if you want to reach this audience especially these younger kids my kids they're not watching a ton of television they're watching some youtube and they're playing these games and so um so that's what i'm working on excellent thank you steven uh, that definitely brings up a number of questions. I mean, uh, again, we'll, we'll get to it, but just to sort of kind of plug to, to flag it, Roblox, Fortnite, I mean, they already are metaverses of themselves, but they're not necessarily Web3 or NFT-ish yet. And, and uh, at least in my experience, I'm curious if this would be yours or, or other folks uh, watching. There's so much heat around Web3 right now that it has to be an NFT or it has to be a certain thing tied to the blockchain but you already have a metaverse in those two early examples. So let, let's table that for a second, but I'd be kind of curious for your thoughts on that as we get to it. But Tiffany, please, uh, Patreon, incredible. The creator economy, how you guys are empowering it and supporting it. We'd love to hear more. Great. Um, so our mission at Patreon is to fund the creative class. Um, we're essentially a membership platform. We have over 250,000 creators and the 8 million fans that follow, follow them. Um, and so we really think of ourselves as sort of a best place for creators of all types to kind of build uh, membership businesses by providing this exclusive access to their work and create a deeper connection for communities. So I would say our direct to consumer is really through them and us being sort of the horizontal platform that enables them to do that. Um, we definitely see ourselves as more than just being a payment platform. We definitely think of the creator class as really being this huge driver force in culture and commerce. And we see ourselves as sort of sitting at the center of that. Um, so from creators like Issa Rae to Crime Junkie, we're just really building this ecosystem uh, for products to really power the independent creator. And, and we hope to usher in the second renaissance of ideas. And so our hope is that at the end of the day, um, we feel like we've been able to really um, change the way that art is valued and um, really help to power this creative economy. But we think about sort of the direct to consumer and sort of how we think about that. Um, we definitely see the direct to consumer piece as being a core part of just how we think about the work. Um, so it's at the core of what we do. We want to make it easier to really connect creators directly with their fans, um, and they want that, and uh, we want to try to make that easier while also creating a layer so that they get the, the sustainability in their own income. Um, and so we really want them to be able to own that relationship. I think one of the things that we see in the creator economy is that as you have more and more folks who are able to, you know, everyone has an iPhone or everyone's able to create, but not everyone is able to monetize. And so we really want to try to remove the friction um, to make that um, super easy. So um, our product really powers everything from how they can get that, that payments and having that ongoing um, payments to um, making it easier to host um, as it relates to media, as well as kind of create community 
community. So um, we can go a lot deeper into some of the specific features that, um, that we think about when we do that, but we definitely see this platform as being an important opportunity and pathway um, for creators to continue of all sizes to really have that direct to consumer uh, relationship. Uh, Tiffany, we'll, we'll stay with you for a second, just because it's a, a nice jumping off point. One of the things that really, uh, really struck me as we had a kind of a, a pre-call for the panel, uh, we spoke about some of the overarching, uh, kind of the, ne the next level down, I guess. We have the overarching direct-to-consumer revolution, uh, but then you get to the next level about community and ownership and democratization and monetization. We'll, we'll certainly not keep touching on monetization, but uh, some of the way that you spoke about community and ownership really was interesting to me. And I'd love to explore that a little more in the sense that ownership for a creator, all of a sudden a consumer has ownership over what they're choosing to watch because it's not just force fed, obviously. And that, I think we can talk about that with, with Pluto TV and uh, there's a lot of sort of overlap with it, but particularly in the creator economy, and then they build a sub community, but then they own that, but then they also put it out to places where it's almost windowed, right? Like from Patreon and, and behind, a, you know, behind a, a paywall to a place like a YouTube and they build their community in different places with different windows and different price points. Uh, so again, community and ownership, I, I would love to hear more of your thoughts around that since Patreon is really helping to define that creators who are, and the creators themselves are then completely redefining it, what it means to actually make content in the media space. Yeah, I mean, there's so many nuances to that question. And I think it's yeah. one that we, we think about quite a lot. I mean, I think we really wanna change the way that art is valued and create more democratization. And I think there are a lot of platforms that are out there that do that, but they don't create the monetization. So while you might be um, reaching more folks um, you're not necessarily creating a monetization model that becomes sustainable over time. And so we, you know, our founder, Jack Conti, um, he is a, he's a creator himself. He's a member of, of two bands. And I'll just tell you a quick story because that sort of ties into this question. Um, the reason why he started Patreon is um, he, he was huge on YouTube. He had lots and lots of followers and he decided he was going to create this um, video where he maxed out his credit cards in order to create this video. He really literally recreated the Millennium Falcon um, from scratch and it was like robots and it was like really, you know, incredible um, uh, sort of outpouring of his art and put the video out on YouTube. And sure enough, it was a huge hit. Um, he had millions of folks watching this video. And after he maxed out his credit cards, put his heart and soul into this, he gets a check from YouTube and it's like $115, you know? And it's like, wow. Um, I don't feel like my, my art in this moment is, is really valued. And so that was sort of the inspiration of him getting with Sam Yam and really creating this platform to really solve for that democratization. And so by changing the way that art is valued, you're creating um, a space where you need to think differently. You, you wanna think uh, as an entrepreneur thinks about a business. And so we wanna add more of that business layer and that entrepreneurial layer into that work. And so, um, what we're starting to see in terms of trends and how creators are um, utilizing sort of and differentiating how they would work with a Patreon versus an Instagram, for example, and Instagram becomes an opportunity to kind of put your brand out there and kind of allow you to sample and get engaged. But when you're ready to move on to a Patreon, what you're saying is, I actually want to drive exclusive content and exclusive experiences. And I want to provide that for folks who want to deepen that relationship with me. And so you're seeing sort of different ways and models that people are doing that, but they are now starting to be a lot more thoughtful and a lot more intentional with this idea of like, this is actually my livelihood. This is what I do. This is not a side hustle. We wanna kind of create a space where this becomes a core part of, of any anybody's craft, what we all do for a living. We, we expect some monetization for that. And so I think that platform and how we think about that helps them to decide how much and how do they wanna use a TikTok or a YouTube or an Instagram versus kind of creating this uh, stickier relationship uh, with the fans who love them. Awesome. Thank you, Tiffany. And, and I apologize a little bit. Some of these are going to be slightly awkward segues. Again, the, the, the businesses that you three are in are, are, are fairly different. Uh, <laughs> so Jeff, I want to come over to you and I want to ask, I mean, to a certain extent, taking a, a little bit of a thread from, from Tiffany's, uh, how do you guys look at community for something like uh, a subscription video on demand or a free ad supported streaming? And then 
uh, and you may, and you may not, it may just be kind of brand brand type things, but I'd be curious how that is. And then I have a secondary question I want to pull from the audience, uh, for you in just a sec. Okay. What well, we do, we do. I mean, I will, I have to start by saying to Tiffany, I mean, I admire so much the platform that Patreon has built, but also the, the, the way that individual creators are, are, are able to create their own communities, leverage platforms other than Patreon to, 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 you know, to, um, you know, to build and communicate with those communities. And I'll just say that big media companies like Paramount are, you know, are paying attention, you know, the, the, we, we absolutely leverage communities to the, to build and leverage communities to the benefit of, you know, growing our business and particularly in streaming. So I am actually fortunate that I also oversee our, um, our business partnerships with the major, major social platforms. And so, and so I have it, I have a team that structures those commercial relationships, but also in the theme of alignment drives internal alignment about how we can use those platforms. And like everyone's going to nod their head here in very different ways based on the platform, whether it's, um, you know, Twitter or snap or, um, you know, or, or YouTube, or even, I mean, we built in Roblox, right? And so these are ways for us to extend the brands, extend the content and franchises. In this case, oftentimes the characters like SpongeBob has a Twitter handle. Um, and, uh, and then, and then, you know, reach new audiences. And then, and then also Stephen mentioned the word authentic, like, and I found myself nodding there, like to, to do so in an authentic way, because the community, they, 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 they understand this, they sense this, that it has to be, it has to be genuine, but we have these, this team of experts that, that, you know, we, we have my team that, that manages those relationships to build, you know, growing commercial partnerships with these platforms. And then we have these experts who, who know and, and essentially own those brands and characters internally, and they use those platforms to create and maintain communities. And so these are examples, like I mentioned SpongeBob, RuPaul has a, has a massive following. Um, Daily Show is another example where, where, you know, every day, all day, there's a, there's a conversation with that audience, despite the fact that the core product is, is still essentially, you know, broadcast. Um, and then another, another, uh, another illustration just comes to mind. Um, it's, it's SEAL Team. Now, because this is, this is an interesting example that's not, it's not community so much as social. There are is a bunch of followers of the SEAL Team uh, actors and, and the show um, on social platforms. But, but the way community played a role in SEAL Team is SEAL Team was on the bubble at CBS. It was a very popular show. It's also quite an expensive show. And we had to make a decision as Paramount what to do with that show. And because we had a really strong sense of one, the size of the audience, but two, that that audience, that community was so connected with the show that they would follow it from broadcast to streaming. It was the first example of a show where we successfully migrated it from a, from a multi-season broadcast product to a streaming product. And then it was talk about alignment and internal partnership. The way we did it was a four episode arc on CBS, which ended in a cliffhanger. And the only way to continue on with SEAL Team was to, was to subscribe to Paramount Plus. Um, and, and we, and we, we absolutely did it. It's one of our most popular shows and, you know, and identifying that community, um, you know, both in understanding the potential of the show and then being able to move that community from one platform broadcast to another streaming was critical. That's, that's the golden ring, Jeff, to, to move them from traditional into, into, uh, digital, if you will. That's, that's a great example. Uh, the secondary question I had for you, this is actually from the audience, uh, and this is particularly in light of the, the recently announced Walmart uh, deal that Paramount Plus had, which, which is huge. I mean, that, that, that's a fantastic bundle. Uh, but what are some of the most interesting partnership models that you've seen in SVOD, in the fast space? Are they similar? Are they different? Are you always looking for um, a marketing and just promotion? Are you looking, do you, do you actually assign ultimately an LTV to that, a lifetime value to that partnership? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you think about those? Is it again just to build more community, to build more awareness, or build more community, or to drive more monetization ultimately in each respective area of the business? It's a great, it's a great question. the The short answer is it depends. I'll give the longer answer. Um, 
the you know the the all of these decisions are underpinned by by the by the math and you know the the sort of rigorous analysis and that's why you know we benefit from the fact that strategy lives alongside partnerships at paramount where where you know we're not essentially outsourcing that math we come together as a group and decide what makes a good partnership once we're negotiating what what you know features of a partnership are more or less important um and then in terms of the partnership what's you know what partnerships are interesting that the it's it's actually it's actually quite fascinating how much it varies because uh in one in let's maybe call it a spectrum um and let's assume that this is a spectrum of meaningful partnerships because because you know there there we only have time both in terms of deal making and in terms of all the product and technology work that it takes to make these partnerships a reality to do meaningful deals so on on one side you you might have relatively straightforward deals um and let's call these distribution this is this is finding ways to distribute uh, our services paramount plus and pluto on on you know scale platforms so this would be an ios or an android a connected television partner like roku or a samsung um and so those are interesting and important partnerships because the scale that they can bring um but they don't they don't they're certainly not cookie cutter um and they can be you know even more innovative than um there's no limit to how innovative they 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 can they can be and so and so the only qualification there is add, as you add complexity you add degree of difficulty and so and so on then that end of the spectrum that you know the deals tend to be relatively straightforward i do take pride in us finding ways to find mutual advantage with a partner growing the pie that's always our focus rather than fighting over the piece of the pie and then on the other end of the spectrum you have you have sort of truly truly innovative partnerships partnerships that um that don't fit into a you know a clear a clear bucket and and that also increases the degree of difficulty but walmart's a perfect example i i mean i couldn't be more proud of that deal um it is it is transformational for both companies and that's it feels a little silly to say for a company the size of walmart but you know walmart plus is 150 million people every week shop with walmart either in stores or online and and walmart plus is an opportunity for walmart to create an ongoing relationship with those with those customers and we have been talking for a while with walmart about how we could through a partnership expand that value proposition to be more complete to extend enjoyment and entertainment into that value proposition and then have a more complete product and there you're benefiting from um a particular strength in paramount where we we you know in identifying our competitive advantage one of them is is the breadth of our content so kids reality scripted uh you know major movies sports and news all in one place we were able to offer a broad compelling offering for walmart customers that matched up really well not in terms of just as breath but actually all of the things that we're good at their customers tend to like and so um not an easy deal to 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 figure out it took us quite a while and a great deal of effort but they were as encouraged by the opportunity as as we were and and so and so and i should have started with an explanation of the, of the what the deal is i'll i'll do so now with a quick explanation so last week we announced a partnership where paramount plus is bundled in walmart plus so every walmart plus member this is their subscription service which gives users things like free shipping free grocery delivery a gas discount now has access to to a free paramount plus um account Jeff, it's a fantastic deal. I mean, it, it, look, it's Amazon's been able to be vertically integrated, obviously, across their sort of commerce and, and content offering. But now for you guys to be Walmart's partner, I mean, that's that's congrats on the deal. I mean, that's that's it's seismic, honestly. That's that's very neat. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And and I mean, it's obviously it's, you know, it's obviously seismic for Paramount, you know, Paramount and Paramount Plus. But it's it's also totally one of those high growing partnerships yeah, right good for everybody together, right together we're, we're going to be able to create a ton of a ton of value let's let's stand partnerships a little bit as a way again to monetize in the economy Stephen I want to come back to to you and into the metaverse and and as much as you can speak to kind of the nft and, and cryptocurrency there is a 
I have a couple a couple of questions on that and want to dig back into Roblox and, and, and Fortnite, et cetera. But there's an, uh, a question from the audience too. Uh, if you can speak to it, how are brands navigating and managing uh, really the kind of the volatile landscape of crypto and NFTs and how do they look on that with a potential connection to their audience? Again, take it to your, to your earlier point, a Nike, a Gucci, uh, those are fairly traditional, I mean, not blue blood brands, I mean, you know, uh, but, but certainly uh, real, you know, big companies with, you know, real identities, uh, maybe not to their most conservative brands. I mean, it's not Procter and Gamble, but there are, they are, you know, clearly well-developed brands with identities and communities of themselves. Moving into something like an NFT or crypto might be tough since it's just, it's, it's a little bit of the wild, wild west. I mean, do you run into that? Or are you starting to run into that? What would be kind of your perspective on it? Yeah. So my, yeah, my sense is certainly it's, it's a super volatile space. Uh, as, as we've seen over the past several months with crypto winter, that there's just, you know, uh, who knows exactly, you know, where the market's headed, how, you know, how things will shake out. I think there's been a variety of different approaches brands have taken to these spaces, to NFTs specifically. Um, you have uh, one brand said to me, um, there's, 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 there's other brands out there that are about trying to cash in and grab the money as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And they said, our brand, we like to wait and see. And so you see, you know, there's some, there's some brands that have really jumped in, have been very aggressive and some have succeeded. Some have fallen flat. Um, certain, and so Nike is an example of a brand that has gone in very big. So it acquired a NFT company called Artifact, um, mm -hmm. which creates like digital sneakers. And so um, they have been sort of like the biggest uh, sort of brand to gain financially from uh, in this space, but that's because they actually went and acquired a, a company that sells NFTs. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but then you have other, other companies that, you know, have, have come out and said, hey, we're releasing this NFT and the people buy this NFT and then and then uh, the brand's like, okay, great. Um, we'll put on a party in, in a city. <laughs> if, you, if you have the NFT, you can come to the city and you can, you can go to this party. And then it leads to uproar, right? Like, wait a minute, this is all I get for you know, purchasing this NFT. So again, like I would take it back, take it back a step. It's just like new technology, right? Like what are your objectives there? What are you trying to do? How are you creating community? engaging with your community in a, in a, in a way that, that is authentic, that provides value uh, to, to, to both parties. And if you're not doing that and it comes off as just a money grab, then that's a bad look for, for everybody involved. And so mm -hmm. what I've heard in terms of sort of where things are today, it's like, hey, there's, there's, there's brands out there that are saying, oh, we need to understand this space. We believe that these like this technology is transformative that this that this movement is real we might say hey we're in the physical goods business and we see that the sale of physical goods and digital goods are intersecting and in a few years if you buy a physical product you'll get the digital nft version or vice versa and so for those brands are saying hey we're going to experiment we're going to learn but maybe we're not launching anything right now we're doing so privately. We're waiting to see sort of how the market shapes up. And uh, and that makes sense because again, there's just so many players in the space and the space is moving so quickly that I think there's a fear that like, if you sit on the sidelines too long, you're gonna get left behind. Mm. A question for you, maybe reverse that a bit too, Stephen. Uh, you've, they've obviously been an explosion of content created in, in the web three and, and maybe not quite the metaverse space exactly yet, but. Web3 NFT space, uh, uh, Bored Apes. We were speaking about them yep. earlier today, right? Uh, do you see them ever kind of, and I, I may not, I may just not know, they may be doing all right, but like, do you see them kind of going in the opposite direction? Like all of a sudden, do they have aspirations to be uh, eventually a, a branded show on Paramount Plus or, or to move into physical hard? Like, do you see them coming back the opposite way? Obviously you spoke to the idea of traditional brands coming into the metaverse, coming into Web3, using it as a promotional platform and potentially a monetization platform, new line of business. Do you think the a digital first property will come the other direction and have there been any? Yeah. How so the challenges with something like that? 
Sure. So yeah, so Board Ape Yacht Club is uh, the most successful NFT project that's out there. Um, they, on their own, I, I can't remember the exact number, but through the sale of several drops of NFTs, had sold millions of dollars worth of these items. And uh, in the resale market, they're also going for a significant amount of money, even still in the in this crypto winter and, and the, the, the downturn in the market. Um, they went and um, raised, I believe, $450 million in venture capital at a $4 billion valuation. Uh, the company, the parent company of Board API Club, which is called Yuga Labs. And they went and they snapped up another successful NFT collection, uh, CryptoPunks. Uh, so they acquired that. And they're, they're saying that their bet is on creating their own metaverse. And so they're creating, uh, it's called The Other Side. It's a Board Ape Yacht Club themed metaverse. And when they say metaverse, what they're, what they're also saying is really gaming. Like they believe that there's a huge opportunity for them with gaming and gaming tied to NFTs, right? So if you have your avatars, if it's a bored ape, if there's different, you know, again, clothing, virtual items, et cetera, but you have ownership of that item, like that will trans transform how gaming exists today. And, and so uh, that's an example of, you know, one <laughs> incredibly successful, uh, you know, NFT project that has aspirations to be bigger than just an NFT project. They're really moving towards metaverse and gaming. Uh, there's other examples out there. Um, Doodles uh, is, a, is another NFT project that just raised, I believe, $54 million um, in venture funding. And, you know, I think they see themselves as like a new Disney in terms of like very kind of more family friendly aesthetic and IP that they're creating. Um, there's another project, last one is World of Women. So World of Women um, is a, another successful project. They've partnered with uh, Hello Sunshine, Reese Witherspoon's production company. And so they're looking at, you know, ways that they can sort of take their characters, the, you know, the, the narratives, the worlds that they're building and translate them into other platforms. So whether these any of these things will succeed is sort of yet to be determined, um, but it's starting with IP, it's starting with community and it's not just community, but it's community that's willing to invest and believes that, that there's, you know, that there's a real lot of promise behind this project. Got it. Got it. It's a fascinating space, Stephen. Uh, Tiffany, coming back to you, but staying on, on the partnerships, and this is a bit of a question again from the audience. Uh, are there examples of these kind of pie growing partnerships? I mean, I, I love what Jeff was speaking about where it's, it's you're not looking to win, you're looking to grow together, right? You're not, you're not looking to win the deal or win the partnership, you're looking to do something that's mutually beneficial for both. Patreon almost is that of its, of its DNA, but are there examples of partnerships that grow the pie? Does Patreon help to broker those? Does it, does it educate creators on how to, how to build those? Uh, and then, then this a secondary question that's sort of getting tied in from a different member of the audience. Uh, a lot of these have, partnerships have spoken to obviously profit and creative monetization, which makes sense. It's kind of the topic of the panel. But are there particularly on Patreon social impact partnerships or social impact entrepreneurs who are nonprofits that are really making a go of it on your platform? So kind of a twofold question for you, partially around partnerships and partially around this kind of other social impact space. Yeah, um, the way we look at, at partnerships is really um, designed around sort of making sure that the creators um, can um, really fully utilize all of the um, features and benefits and extensive things that we can do to help drive their business forward. So that's most of how we think about partnerships. So we have a creator partnerships team um, that sort of helps to support what their onboarding experience looks like, what are they trying to do and grow. And as we look at the different tiers, thinking about ways to kind of move them along. So um, that is sort of how, how we think about it in our model. We don't have as many examples of sort of how Jeff is describing of diff different ways that our company works with with others but i think ours is definitely more focused on helping to support um, what creators are doing to to build and grow and scale um, we do have examples of um, uh, programming that we're trying to do that 
um, that has sort of a social impact component to it. So um, one such program is called Pull Up. And the purpose of Pull Up is thinking about um, creators, particularly creators of color who um, might be in different stages of their growth and development and almost creating a collective that looks at the next tier down um, to provide additional mentorship and guidance and support to help them think about how do they translate this authentic community and great craft to really bring in um, additional um, uh, uh, patrons into um, their membership base and help them to grow that and help them um, to think about just the, the role that, that they're trying to fill as an entrepreneur. And so sometimes as an entrepreneur, you might be really exceptionally strong at craft, but maybe not as much on other aspects of business. And so um, we have um, folks like Issa Ray, so I mentioned Issa Ray a little bit earlier, um, and others who are sort of at the higher tier and bringing in quite a few, you know, they have lots and lots of fans thinking about how they can help um, support and mentor others. And so we think that um, programming like this helps to really make sure that other, that pretty much all creators can kind of lift and grow um, um, together. And so we do think about um, success in terms of those co cohorts and how we can help support. So um, that's probably the, 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 the example that sort of comes to mind uh, when I think about partnerships in that space. Certainly, certainly. Uh Amazingly enough, we have about 10, 12 minutes left here. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to come to a couple of the more sort of wrap up questions, if you will. I want to I want to grab one from the audience that's that's focused on kind of current Hoyas. Uh, but let, let's get to that. We'll kind of end on that one. Uh, so the, the question I have for each of you in turn, and we can start with Jeff, Stephen to Tiffany. Uh, again, it's that classic cliche sort of wrap up a panel question, but key trends. If you had to pick one for a one year and a five year in your space what would those be and why? And just, just a, a little bit of a once over. I know some of the space, everything's moving so fast, five, maybe not five years, maybe say a three year, a one year trend and a three year trend because God knows five years, it's, it's anybody's guess at this point. Uh, Jeff, if I, could hand, if I could hand and start with you. Sure, sure, Matt. And I'll, I'll take one in five because I think I might need five years for the second one. So the, uh, and, and both of these are not, are not news. So one is, um, is that the, the trend for um, you know content consumption outside of traditional distribution, outside of the traditional business model and traditional platforms, will continue to increase. And so, you know, and so this is this is growth in in pay streaming. It's growth growth in free streaming. It's growth in social. It's growth in the creator economy. It's clearly a growth in 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 innovative, you know, I interactive and immersive, um, you know, uh, properties like 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 metaverse. You know, ultimately, this isn't about watching. It's about you know about viewing. It's about engagement, and and that form of engagement is absolutely going to continue to change from what it used to be, which is several people watching the same thing in the living room at once. Um, and then over five years. I think we will we will finally see um, the 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 outcome of that in terms of in terms of the broader industry at scale. And so what this means is that is that today both business models have been supported, right? The you know there is such thing as cord cutting, and the traditional model is shrinking, but it it certainly hasn't fallen off cliff. And I don't know that it will fall off a cliff, but that transition as more critical mass moves to new platforms, not just streaming, but other forms of engagement, you know, like it doesn't really matter whether it's Paramount Plus or, Ro or Roblox, it's not television. And, and so over a five-year time horizon, I think that transition will, will now drive meaningful impact to the underlying businesses and business models. And so that's where the key challenge is 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 which businesses will be able to both internally align to grow and then externally find a, a strategy and execution that positions them to to grow in an incredibly competitive competitive space for for engagement and you know you can imagine i like paramount's odds i think we have an incredible set of assets i think we have the right strategy and, and we've shown extraordinary execution. And so that's that's our job is for over the course of that five years to position our company um, in every way we can for growth. Well said, Jeff, well said. And and, uh, and we'll see, right? That's been the challenge of big traditional media companies. I mean, that the, the quintessential kind of uh, 
digital pennies and analog dollars. But I mean, that tipping point is, is right here. It's, it's coming. Right. And I think the right. to your point about Paramount, but gosh, that Walmart deal, that'll, that'll certainly help to accelerate that push. So, uh, congrats. Again. One piece in a, in a massive puzzle. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Matt. Uh, Steven to you, uh, a one-year trend and then take your pick on a three or five-year trend. Yeah. So I think the, I think to me, the, the one-year trend is, is just what we're already seeing in terms of more and more brands um, activating. And whether it's metaverse, whether it's gaming, it, it's just kind of mind-boggling to me that you know gaming is so huge and you haven't seen uh, brands integrating into games until recently. And so when, you, when I, like I'm a big player of FIFA, uh, the soccer game and the banners have always said like follow FIFA on Facebook. They, they haven't used like what you would expect when you're actually watching a soccer game, which is Coca-Cola or whatever, you know, sort of major brand. And so, you know, expect that this will only increase more and more brands getting involved in gaming and metaverse type experiences. And then, you know, I think three to five years, uh, I guess I'm really interested in seeing how whether it is a the biggest YouTubers or the biggest brands, whoever can, whoever can drive the most audience is where are they pushing those audience to, whether it's their own platform, whether it's other platforms, whether it's building their own businesses. Um, Mr. Beast comes to mind as an example, building restaurants and candy bars. And uh, there's a variety of other examples out there. And so what a media company looks like, how that media company monetizes through totally different business lines through selling physical items, virtual items, like anything uh, like that diversification and more case studies, more examples of what that looks like um, is, is I believe where we're headed. I think that's a very, a very, very good thing to keep an eye on, Stephen. I, I, I mean, Lord knows my kids are only wearing YouTuber t-shirts now too. So it's, <laughs> it's certainly moving in the brick and mortar there. Uh, Tiffany, for yourself, uh, next year for the creative economy and then a three or five year time horizon. Yeah, um, so I definitely think um, the 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 trend that we're kind of paying attention to is kind of understanding how just overall um, uh, the AI that that we're starting to see on a lot of these um, social platforms like the Facebooks and Instagrams of the world, how that's changing consumer behavior on how they um, access content. Um, so people are so overstimulated, but are these AIs doing a good enough job of really refining and helping people um, discover? So thinking about what does search and discovery um, look like in this new model on what excites you and gets you excited um, to click in and click further. And I think um, creators, that can be both the benefit of creators of being able to do search and discovery and get discovered, or it could mean that you might be getting um, filtered out. And we're starting to see some creators that are on these platforms who already have the following getting worried that they're actually getting lost in a sea of try this real, try that real. So I think um, just understanding what the future of search and discovery, um, mm -hmm. what are the long-term implications as it relates to consumer behavior. Um, picking a five-year trend, I'm totally um, buying what Steven is selling. It's something that I think about. Um, what really motivates me is um, I want to see a world where um, a fifth grader when they're, you know, they do that report on what they want to be when they grow up. And when they proudly say, I want to be a creator, people aren't shunning them and like, you should do something proper, like be a doctor or a lawyer. Um, but that they're like, oh my goodness, here is an actual career path to help you get um, footed um, around um, what you desire to create. And I think um, a five-year future for us is we definitely will see a rise of creators um, who actually are um, taking this very seriously, a la, a la the Mr. Beast of the world, um, mm -hmm. thinking about the multiple verticals that they'll be able to play and having a need for business tools and business platform that gives them control just like any other Silicon Valley founder of any other company thinks about their business. And so um, that's something that we at Patreon are absolutely focused on. Like we definitely are focusing on content and community and that's what we are known for in terms of that membership platform. But we're also looking at how might we help an entrepreneur. Um, and so being able to offer more ways to help them um, sort of navigate this big mega brand that they're building for themselves, recognizing that we will start to see more, more creators. It's only gonna grow up 
up from here? And so how do we really help um, to support that and also giving them the modular flexibility um, to design it their way? So I know that there was a question um, on one of the Q&A uh, questions around how do we think about the Instagrams of the world who are starting to offer paid subscription. We just think paid subscription is just one small part of a bigger value chain that we can um, provide for, um, for our entrepreneur creators. And so I think that's where our focus is, recognizing that they need a bit more um, as they grow and extend their brands against uh, multiple verticals. Thank you, Tiffany. That's that's uh, the, the the discovery piece is critical. I was played in the uh, my last company was in the app ecosystem, and God, discovery just got to be a bear in in, in that business. Uh, but to stay on the career path, and I'm going to wrap up with this question. Uh, we do have a freshman who's uh, you know a, a freshman Hoya, a massive gold star for already starting to think about your career path and where you want to go with this. Uh, you're light years ahead of where I was at the at the same time. Uh, but what would be the one piece of advice from, from, from each of you respectively? Again, for somebody who wants to work in the digital world, uh, you know, for, or for that as a, a career path, uh, work experience, what would be the one piece of advice? Again, a great classic way to wrap up a panel, particularly for an organization like GEMA, which supports not only alumni, but also obviously current students. So uh, maybe we'll go same order again, but uh, well, no, let's reverse it. Tiffany to start, Stephen, and then Jeff, you can wrap it up. Such a good question. Um, I think the, the good news about a freshman, if, if, not to put bias on age, because anyone could be a freshman, but I'm almost envisioning that this talent is probably already digital native. Um, and I think that that is a huge source of advantage. So I was trying to think, what would I add on? Um, the one thing that comes top of mind for me is um, psychology and anthropology. Like I think um, all of the things that we're growing and, and developing comes from consumer behavior. So similar to what we were talking about with, with AI, it's like someone's thinking about the logic that would make this particular thing um, be really appealing to me and make me, make me want to feel a sense of connection to that thing. So I just think in a digital economy and as we continue to grow, um, really understanding psychology and user experience and really um, throwing that with the digital experience um, into making better decisions that really kind of create um, the outcomes that we want to see in this world. So um, that's just one thing that that's top of mind for me and a slightly oddball answer, but that is what came to me. Oh, love it. Got to, got to know who you're, you're dealing with and know, know your audience. Uh, so that makes a ton of sense to me. Steven. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, I can't really come up with one piece, but I just came up with three. So it's um, like be curious, uh, create, and then connect. So uh, just follow your passions. What are the things that you're curious about? Explore those, create around that, whether you're sharing that in public or you're just like making sense of it in your own mind, in your own journals. Like how does how does this curiosity sort of manifest and where does it take you? And then connect with others that that share that same passion, that curiosity. Um, that was what I got to do as a YouTube creator. And that led to sort of a, a real sort of explosion in my career, um, just pursuing those passions. And so that's my advice. It's a great piece. I think there are so many tools now where you can self self start, I guess, Stephen, maybe to extrapolate a little bit. The idea that your middle one to, to do it, like actually just create, you know, and, and whatever that ends up being in your, whatever area you're, you're interested in, uh, easier said than done, I know, but there are so many self-starter tools out there now that just didn't exist when, you know, uh, some of us really old folks were matriculating through, uh, through the hilltop. But Jeff, uh, to throw it to you to kind of wrap it up, uh, a piece of advice. Okay, happy to. You. I mean, I got to say, I'm mystified by by a freshman who knows what she or he wants to wants to do with their life. Because I, I had no idea. Arguably, I still I still don't. But I very much backed into my career, um, and for that reason, one piece of advice would be that would be that it's okay to learn on the job, right? Like I I went to law school, and I haven't been a lawyer for over two two decades. Um, you know, I very much um, found something I was interested in, ultimately that I was good at, and then learned how to do it on the job. And so when I meet young people, what's interesting to me is not particularly like the subject matter expertise because 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 somebody with, with sufficient energy is going to learn. So it's enthusiasm, um, you know, genuine, authentic energy for what we're doing. And then I'll just call it like a point of view, right? Some somebody who has taken the time to to develop a point of view about the company and the industry and the role that they can that they can play. 
Jeff, I think those are very wise words. We, we uh, with the GEMA externship and a, a, a shameless plug for those who are undergrads, look at the GEMA website, uh, speak to some of the folks in the Career Center. The, the externship is a great way to get some uh, networking and, and some more face-to-face -face time in both New York and Los Angeles. But it's exactly what we say. You, you want to be curious, you want to be energetic, you want to have a point of view. You know, I mean, ultimately, uh, uh, you know, if, if you want to take a little time off after undergrad and just exhale for a bit after a pretty intense four years, that's all right. If you come with curiosity and energy and a point of view, you know, that's, that's still, you know, you can still get to where you want to go career-wise. Uh, but with that being said, we're at the top of the hour, uh, five o'clock West Coast, eight o'clock East Coast. So I think uh, we'll probably leave it here. There's, I know there's some more questions. There were some very specific questions in the chat, which we wanted to kind of keep at a little higher level. Uh, but thank you all for uh, participating, the panelists. I think we are, sorry, the audience, certainly we had almost 100 uh, over the course of this, which is amazing and, and a tribute to the Georgetown community, to, to Rachel, uh, to Rich Batista, who I think did join us here uh, and the community that GEMA's built and obviously the community that we sit on top of, which is Georgetown and we all have a lot of affection for. Uh, a big thank you to all three of you as panelists, uh, Stephen, Tiffany, Jeff, thank you very much for a good discussion and, and some interesting things. So we'll. We'll be curious to kind of see how it goes in three pretty different parts of the new world, but uh, uh, there's some exciting stuff happening. So thank you very much for the time, uh, both audience and panelists. And I think we'll wrap here. Right. Thanks, Matt. Cool. Thank you.